to introduce Liang as our keynote speaker. Uh, you've all got Liang's uh, biography in, the, in your pack, um, so I won't read that out, but the, uh, the great pleasure for us is that Liang is here as uh, representing Wikipedia and a very proactive part of Wikipedia to work with the communities to add uh, cultural content from a range of countries and uh, languages and cultures. Uh, my pleasure, uh, actually, I am proud to admit that I am the one who found Liam on his travels around the world um, uh, when we met uh, as, um, in the context of Europeana, the European Digital Library. And Liam gave a talk that was called Love, Peace and Metadata. And I thought anybody who can invent such a title must be kind of special. <laughs> um, and it was a great presentation, so we were able to persuade Liam to come and join us here for our GA. And I look forward to his today's version of Love, Peace and Metadata. And, um, and um, also to his workshop and to us interacting very uh, actively and intensively with uh, this great uh, source of knowledge, which is the Wikipedia. So let's give a hand to the other. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the existence of Wikipedia? You know, you've heard of this thing before. Yes, fantastic. Yes. Do you know it's not only in English? personally can change it. Good, this is a fantastic beginning. So, to start with, everything that I will say today is in some way related to this page, glamwiki.org. Glam is our acronym for the cultural sector, galleries, libraries, art collections, museums, but it also includes things like zoos or botanic gardens or universities to a certain degree, uh, broadcasters and so forth. Glamwiki is are uh, part of the larger community in Wikipedia to try and build good connections, relationships between the cultural sector and the Wikipedia community for mutual benefit. It's a symbiotic relationship because the more available the resources are from the cultural sector, the better the quality of our footnotes and our references and the better the quality of Wikipedia, which means more people see it, which means more people go back to those original resources. So it's win-win. Now, you're all familiar with one of these logos, the Wikipedia logo. I should describe that Wikipedia is one project of a lot of sister projects in what we call the Wikimedia community. Wikimedia is the organization, is the charitable foundation in America and also charities in several countries around the world. It's a bit like the way the Red Cross works. There's the organization, the headquarters, and then there's national organizations. And then there are several projects that run, Wikipedia being the most famous, but also the Wikimedia Commons, which is the, uh, the one immediately below the Wikipedia logo. That's the multimedia repository. There's also Wikibooks, which is an open educational resource provider of textbooks and educational didactic materials. There's uh, Wikiversity, which is a wiki uh, education platform for teaching and learning. There is um, Wiktionary in the bottom left hand corner, the little tile, the nine tiles, the little like Scrabble. That's an online dictionary uh, and a thesaurus in multiple <coughs> languages. So when we're talking about Wikipedia, we're actually talking about a whole series of sister projects and a whole community. Why I think you need to know about this stuff. The first thing is that Wikipedia is the fastest way, the most efficient way to connect between your content and the potential audience. Now, uh, some, someone this morning was talking about uh, research reference librarians. Who was, who was mentioning reference librarians? Yes. Now, I would suggest that one thing that reference librarians should be doing, every time they are answering, they're sending a student or a request to a particular book or a particular original resource, especially original materials, unique materials, rare materials, 
they should be adding that as a footnote into the relevant Wikipedia article. Because, as you know, most students and most people who are looking for information online <coughs> will go to Google. And the first thing in Google is Wikipedia. I'm not talking Google Scholar, just, just Google. And you know this, Wikipedia turns up at the top all the time. So if you can put your materials that are the most relevant, the best uh, connection between the search question and the answer, that is a reference librarian's job. And you can do it for people that you've never met before. So the family, the family encyclopedia of the 21st century is Wikipedia. Those people who are engaged in public information sharing and, and knowledge whose job it is as librarians to be the interface between someone looking for knowledge and someone who's publishing knowledge, Wikipedia can be that for you. The second major point is that we are a global community. As I, as I pointed out before, Wikipedia is not just in one language, it is everywhere. This was our uh, annual conference a couple of years ago in Alexandria. Uh, one of those people is my friend from Australia and a couple of the other people there are from the local Egyptian Wikipedia community. I'm sure you can guess who is who. And the, and the, the main point I'd like to make out of this is that Wikipedia, unlike most educational uh, charities or philanthropic organizations involved in education, it is not simply some rich Western project that will come into your country and tell you how to do education and tell you what is the best for your country and in your culture. Because Wikipedia, whilst it is run and has a headquarters in San Francisco, is locally administered in over 280, 280 languages. So every language that you know, every language that you've never heard of, we have a Wikipedia of different sizes. Obviously, the English is the largest. But each one of those projects is locally administered with the, all of the software in the local language, all of the uh, hierarchy of editorial control, all of the checks and balances, all of the uh, procedures in the language and run by the local community. Now, I can be involved in, if I spoke uh, Belarusian, for example, I could be involved in the Belarusian Wikipedia from where I live in Australia doesn't mean you have to be physically local, but the diaspora community for a lot of these languages is really important, especially the Indian languages, for example. A lot of people editing in the Hindi Wikipedia are doing so from America or England or Australia. This is hugely important for sharing knowledge back and forwards across countries, and it is not about some American company telling you how to do education in your own country. So these are some pictures from recent uh, events, meetings we had for the 10th anniversary of Wikipedia. In January this year was the 10th anniversary of the existence of Wikipedia. This was in Dhaka, Iceland, Iran, and Jakarta, for example. So, we're everywhere. And there is a local community in your country, working in your language, that would love to get in contact with you and build a proactive partnership uh, with your institution and share some resources. In a lot of these countries, the problem, as you know, is that there is not much online in that language. It's difficult to find content in a lot of countries' uh, native languages, and so we can hopefully help with that. It's also freely available. Now, the next major point why I think you need to know about Wikipedia is that it is huge and it is also quite small. This is now at least two years out of date, this picture, to represent the size of, Wiki of the English edition of Wikipedia if it was printed at the scale that Encyclopedia Britannica is printed at. It's now much bigger than that. But the density, the sheer scope of this project is much, much more than you would expect in any other. It is the largest single work of knowledge in one place ever the single biggest book ever. It is also the most widely accessed educational material ever. On average, across the world, Wikipedia is the fifth most
most accessed website, all of the websites uh, in, in the entire world, following Google as number one, Yahoo, Facebook, and YouTube, and then Wikipedia. And then all the rest of the next 100 or 200 most visited websites are different companies or social networks or video websites or different things like that. This is the only .org and only purely educational project anywhere near the top. So it's quite, it's quite large and quite, quite visible. As you can see, there is relatively low penetration in Africa, Brazil, and India as a percent of population, which is why the Wikimedia Foundation, the headquarters, is having a specific focus over the next five years to work in those specific areas, not to the inclusion of other areas, but especially in North Africa, Brazil, and India, there will be a large focus over the next five years. As you can see here, within the next three or so years, note that this finishes in 2009, there will be over 500 million, half a billion unique individual people accessing Wikipedia in all languages every month. That's a lot of people. And then we spend no money on advertising. We don't have any advertising and we don't advertise ourselves. The visibility and the density of information is entirely derived from charitable donations in terms of, in, to fund ourselves and there is no corporation behind it, there is no advertising, it's an entirely non-profit uh, charity organization. So it's not like in a lot of circumstances there will be an organization that has, that is a company that is giving away some educational materials in exchange for advertising the fact that they are being nice to a developing country or some press back home. This is not about that. There are at least 100,000 people who make five, ten edits a month. That's what we consider to be an active editor. Many, many, many more people edit once a month or maybe they go, they don't for six months or whatever. Um, and yet there are only about 50 employees, most of whom are responsible for keeping the website running. So all of the editorial control is done by a volunteer community. It's entirely managed by the community. Every aspect of the functioning of the website itself. We are free in a very technical sense. This does not just mean you do not have to pay us. It means you do not have to pay us, but more than that. We are free in quite four precise ways which comply with the definition of free cultural works. This is the most important ideological part of Wikipedia. It's a bit like open source software uh, in that sense, if you're familiar with open source software. So you have the freedom to use the work. You have the freedom to study the work, to make copies of the work, and to change the work. None of this says you do not have to pay it, uh, that you cannot use, um, so that you cannot charge people for it. We are quite happy for people to make commercial use of Wikipedia down the line. We're not commercial, but if some educational provider wants to use Wikipedia in their project, product, fantastic. We just say that you have to say where it comes from and to share your intellectual property as well. So this is not about being anti-commercial, we recognize that many educational projects and many educational providers, such as we've seen outside, have commercial aims, and that's not anti-educational. We want to just to make sure that our content is as available as possible. So, we are free in two quite specific ways, what's called gratis and leave. Free as in money, and free as in liberty. 100% copy left, that is not copyright, 100% open standards, uh, open source software, you are free to use and reuse and distribute and sell and change anything you find on Wikipedia, including the software itself. So these are two examples of commercial reuse of Wikipedia and one of the main reasons why it is so popular, not because Wikipedia web 
website is popular, but because our data is used by third parties to improve their system. So this is the same article about a particular obscure piece of art on the Indianapolis University campus in America. On one side you can see there is Google Maps with every single Wikipedia article that has a geolocation tag, and one of those is that particular sculpture. And then on the other side you can see the Facebook page about that same artwork. Both are using the Wikipedia data set, using the Wikipedia images, using the Wikipedia information and metadata. You can see at the bottom of the Facebook, the little attribution, says where it comes from, says the copyright license. That's fantastic. No one has to ask us permission. No one has to pay us. It's available to use and reuse. There is also a quite important third angle to the freedom that is important in, especially important in some countries, that being able to have access to knowledge is very important to the political process and to the social process and the education process. We do not provide a different kind of Wikipedia depending on what country you live in. Everyone, that every year, person visiting Wikipedia, no matter what country they're coming from, gets everything. So we're not censored for particular political or religious or language version uh, politics of each country. And I, I think you can understand the significance of that in some countries. So I'd like to rec suggest or should demonstrate three example projects that have happened in different national libraries around the world. This is no means a, a complete list of the kinds of things that we can do together, but these are three examples of things that we have done. The first is with the National Library of France. They have a project to scan and digitize and then do optical character recognition of lots of their material in the National Library of France. Unfortunately, a lot of it is old and difficult for the computer to read and do the, the text correction. So one thing that the National Library of France did was to give us hundreds of thousands of these scans, which we would put onto Wikimedia Commons, the multimedia repository, and then we would take to another sister project called Wikisource, which is all about manual text correction, optical, uh, manual transcription. And so this is the comparison of the same scan and then full text that volunteer Wikipedians in France went through and read and typed it up and now that full text of that work and many many other works is visible to Google, is visible to a lot of other places that can take that data set with attribution back to the National Library of France, they can take the data and use it in their systems, they couldn't pay for someone to do that, we did it free because we want to be able to share the knowledge. You could do it in any language. Uh, the second one, the British Library. Just about two weeks ago, we had the second British Library Editathon Day, where the British Library staff gave us a, a special room and brought in some librarians who had access to the, the full collection. And we brought some local Wikipedians in who wanted to be able to spend the day with these librarians just working on the original materials or unique materials, the things that are hard to get normally. And so the, it basically became a, a super research laboratory for one day where these Wikipedians helped the librarians get out to tell the public those 5, 10, 20 major books, resources, projects that are not normally hidden. Uh, so this is the lady in blue is a, is a local Wikipedian and she was helping to type up the, this particular article about a particularly rare book in the British Library collection and the the man next to her in the grey t-shirt is the librarian and they were sharing their process and learning about each other's professional practice. It was a really quite exciting day. And you can do that at any, any library. This one is the National Library of Australia. They have digitised a lot, a lot of out of copyright newspapers from Australia. From the very beginning of newspaper print in Australia up until when copyright starts again. They've digitized all this, they've made it available online. Every newspaper page, every single article has a stable URL to the article. But of course, it's very hard to do the text correction and very hard to share that once you know it's there, unless you happen to be a researcher looking for that particular thing. How would you know it was on page 12 of Monday, the 15th of January, 
1893. What they've done is allow the public to fix the text correction, so very similar to the, the French National Library project I mentioned before, but also you can click the cite button, footnote this fact, and you can see a variety of different methods you can use to cite this fact, one of which is the Wikipedia citation code. So they did this without even asking us, they just did it. Fantastic. Now Wikipedia can come in, take that code, put it into the article that he is editing on Wikipedia, and that will footnote back to that specific article in the newspaper <laughs> project with a lovely little link saying came from the National Library of Australia, a stable link, the date it was accessed, the date the original publication was, the author of the original publication, and so forth, which will then be used that, that particular article, which would have otherwise been hidden, is now referencing a specific fact in the most visible encyclopedia about anything. So it's hugely increased the number of uh, visitors straight to the depths of their collection, not to the front page, but right into the details. And then new visitors discover this project and find their way around. It brings to the surface content that is otherwise hidden. The next thing is, I was what we call the Wikipedian in residence at the British Museum last year. So I invented this concept last year and I wanted to try and say, what could we do if we had a Wikipedia in-house, locally, at this institution for a period of time, at any museum or, or library or archive, what could be achieved if we brought Wikipedia in-house to these institutions? So these are some of the projects that I did at the uh, British Museum last year. First thing was the backstage pass. We spent the day with the curators showing us some interesting objects that don't normally get, get to be on display, a behind the scenes tour. And then in the afternoon, we did the reverse. We showed the curators behind the scenes of Wikipedia. And that brought a lot of personal relationships together, the local editing community in London, and the local academic community in London. And a lot of subsequent projects came from that day because we had spent the day sharing our expertise and getting a relationship, which was hugely useful. We ran a one-on-one -on -one collaborations project where individual Wikipedians would write to me on a public list and say, I'm interested in this subject or this object that has something to do with the British Museum. Can you find me an academic to check my work, please? This is just like you would have, uh, this is just like uh, accessing a, a scholar at a, a university, but they're not necessarily accredited to a university. And the people who are asking these questions are mostly students, they're hugely intellectually engaged, they're really interested in these subjects, and unlike answering a simple academic question to a student, a, a, just a normal student, or answering a question from the public as a reference librarian, if you answer a question to a Wikipedian, you will never have to answer that question again, because anyone else who asks that question will find that answer on Wikipedia and be given your footnote to go to the collection that you suggested. So it has a much, much higher <coughs> sort of a magnification of scale if you work with Wikipedia. Equally, you can see we had some curators, some museum professionals saying, I don't have the time or the technical interest to be able to do this stuff, but I can see it's important. Can you find me a Wikipedia who will write about this, this object that I have been studying for the last 30 years that I wrote my thesis on and I have all the books and I want people to know about it? Fantastic, we can do that too. So it can go both ways. We also ran a project, a prize. We said, okay, you get a gift voucher to the shop. First five people who write a feature article, which is our top level peer review process, the first five people to write a feature article in their own language about anything to do with the British Museum collection, you get a gift, gift voucher for the shop which is motivating for some people, not other people, but it got a bunch of people who would not otherwise have been interested in the British Museum collection <coughs> to focus their energy on this. And so we had some really interesting projects in different languages that we didn't, wouldn't have otherwise had for nothing more than uh, a gift voucher to the museum shop. Then we ran the, the opposite. So that challenge was uh, choose a subject, make a good quality, and do it, and we will reward you. This was, we choose the subject, 
this particular article, the article in question was the Hoxing Hoard. It was the richest collection of Roman silver, gold, jewelry, and coins that had ever been discovered. Very little online about it. Very important object for the British Museum, not much available online. So we said, okay, we take that one subject, we get all of the available curators and the books and the publications and all of the, the best quality resources that you could possibly find for that subject, and we get some fantastic Wikipedians locally and, and from around the world, and we try and focus our energy for one week, one day especially, on this article to see how well we can go. Now, it didn't happen in one week, but over the next month, in coordinating between those Wikipedians and those academics and questioning each other's sources and why did you write this and can you prove that and this very rigorous uh, back and forth academic process, we now have, in my opinion, the best individual Wikipedia article of the entire project on that subject because it's the only one that has been peer reviewed by all the, all the Wikipedians and all of the relevant academics. So it is far and away the best possible resource for this subject. And 90% of the footnotes to that article are linking to the books written by the British Museum staff. So it's promoting their own expertise anyway. We also had a translation project. This was a French high school that was visiting England for their summer uh, project to practice English. So I gave them some articles in the English Wikipedia that did not exist in the French Wikipedia about the British Museum. And they translated in, the, in their school time the first couple of paragraphs of that article and gave it to the teacher who corrected their, their spelling mistakes and things. And then they came to the British Museum and went around to find the objects that they had just been researching and been studying. So we had this very good link between uh, students studying something in class using a platform that they were they were familiar with, Wikipedia, as a they would they knew that but they had never contributed to it. So contributing to it they felt that this assignment was much more important because they knew people were going to read it. Not just their teacher but thousands of people. So they spent much more time and care. And then they went to the British Museum and had a real relationship to the objects and tried to find them and they knew about them. They weren't just walking around the museum vaguely and taking they were engaged in that content. So those, those are just some of the projects that I ran and some of the projects from the libraries I mentioned before. We now have about a dozen other Wikipedians <laughs> in residence now. I was the first at the British Museum. There is now a whole movement, a whole community of residencies in different institutions and they're doing different things. The variety is quite exciting. Uh, in Versailles, in Paris, there is a resident and he's working on a 24-hour challenge same article, the article about the Chateau de Versailles, in all these different languages at once. How can we bring this one article up to a really good quality across the world in 24 hours, which will be an exciting project. In um, the museum, the Children's Museum in Indianapolis, this is a museum focused on all things relevant to pedagogy and young children and their interests. They have a project for getting 12 to 15 year olds interested in higher education. And so they bring these kids in, they call them museum apprentices, <coughs> they bring these kids in and they teach them about a particular object in the collection and then sit them down and learn how to use Wikipedia and they publish their work and their collaboration on Wikipedia because they spend much more time <coughs> interested in it, they focus on that work and they can get some uh, feedback later. It's not just an assignment they did for school because they can take it home and they can show it to their friends. In Derby, which is a regional museum in, in northern England, they've taken QR codes, the kind we, we're seeing around at this conference, and they've linked those to the Wikipedia articles about the subject. So Derby is a small museum, not very rich, and it has, it has just said, okay, this is an object that we know a lot about. We have this object, but we cannot afford to translate the brochure to hand out to every single language that visits, language community that visits our museum. They work with the Wikipedia community to translate the articles about the key objects and subjects in their collection. They put up QR codes next to those objects, and if you scan the QR code with your, with your phone, and, and you, 
it doesn't send you to the Wikipedia article in English. It sends you to the Wikipedia article in the language that your phone is set in. So you don't have to know what it says. You scan it. If the article in Wikipedia exists about that object, the phone knows what language you speak and it sends you to that. A really cheap and easy way of getting information to people in languages that, of their own language. Uh, at the National Archives of America, they have a resident now. He's working with their project, which publishes an important document in the collection every day. So every day there is a new object of the day. And he works with the Wikipedia community to make sure that the article about that particular document or subject about that event is good quality, or if it doesn't exist, to, to create it. And then we can put it on our front page, which is seen about five to seven million times every day. Five to seven million times a day is our front page view. We put new articles on the front page every single day. What's, what's hot, what's fresh, what's, what's happening in Wikipedia right now? So he can take the National Archives on this day project and bring it to Wikipedia and have a very quick turnaround of new publication, massive visibility. It's a small social media project at the National Archives but it's hugely visible now because of this integration. Uh, and we also have Wikipedians in residence at the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, the Berlin State Art Galleries, Art Galleries and Museums. So there are a variety of institutions, big, small libraries, archives. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. How many of you have a volunteer team or community at your institution? Do you work with volunteers at all? Some do. I'm guessing none of you have any project that's specifically an e-volunteer or digital volunteer program. I would suggest that Wikipedia is your volunteer team. You already have a community of digital volunteers engaging with your collection. You just don't know it yet. There is a whole loosely affiliated group of people who are using your collection more or less well that would love to be able to use it better and have more access to it. Now we know some students and some people, as we heard earlier this afternoon, earlier this morning, even when they are given access to the material, they prefer to part. Wikipedians are doing this voluntarily anyway. This is their hobby and they're trying to use your material. So I would suggest if you just let them in, they will make your content much, much more visible and much, much more alive because of that. They're already your work, they're already your team, you just don't have a program with them yet. There are a few resources that you can use to find out more. Uh, I have brought a couple of them with me. Uh, if you'd like to have a read of either the quite large How Wikipedia Works book or the quite small Wikipedia reader's guide. You can collect them from me today or tomorrow or the next day. Most of the information about how to edit and the specifics of the editorial policy you can go through on Tuesday when I'm doing the workshop. And um, all of the information specifically to cultural partnership relationships you can find at glamwiki.org. Thank you for your attention and time. These slides are already available online, so if you just find my, my Twitter account, uh, Witi Lama, and then you can, there's a link to the slides, so you can take them home and, and read through the links in more detail if you'd like. Thank you very much.
that's not, it's entirely optional, but if you just want to hang out with some Wikipedians, you're more than welcome. And equally, on Tuesday, there is the, the workshop, which I'll be running, and, and they will be participating in as well to answer your specific questions about policy or editorial and so forth. Where is the meetup? Uh, where is the meetup? Paul? Me. Uh, we cannot have break. <laughs> <laughs> so at the, at the coffee break, at, at 3.30 or whenever we have the next break, come and talk to us then, and we'll tell you where. Okay? There's a contact us button there. Are there any other questions? Yeah.